Okay, we're back. We're live with Think Tech here on a given Thursday afternoon. Um, and we're doing community matters because they do. That's why. And uh, the title of our show tonight is Open House to the Heavens. Okay. And, and we're with Roy Gow, Assistant Astronomer at IFA. That's the Institute for Astronomy on Woodlawn Drive. That's right. Where God lives. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so say hello to the people, Roy. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and hopefully we'll see you in person. <laughs> How many astronomers do you know? Think about it. <laughs> Real live yeah. astronomer. <laughs> anyway, uh, first I wanted to get a handle on the life on Woodlawn Drive. I've always admired that building. I've always felt that that was the best or one of the best examples of architecture, which is a scant word at UH Manoa. <laughs> in UH Manoa, it's really a nice-looking building. What's it like there? Well, uh... It's a pretty active place. We have a lot of astronomers working there, uh, engineers, uh, so lots of pretty astronomical pictures on the wall, um, lots of news. Sometimes we get the news crews up there covering the great results we have. Oh, sure. So we have lots of great talks. So it's a quite active place, and uh, you know, the Institute for Astronomy is the biggest academic astronomy department in the entire United States. So it's a, it's a big place, a lot of people. And why is that? I mean, why should we be so lucky, uh, so endowed, you know, to have an IFA right here in Hawaii, um, that when it doesn't, they don't have such a thing in other places in the country. Why? Well, uh, it all is uh, location, 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 um, and I'm not a real estate agent. Um, so <laughs> uh, it's because we have uh, the incredible uh, uh, mountains of Mauna Kea and Haleakala, which are in the northern hemisphere and possibly in the entire world, the absolute best places to do observational astronomy. So, and that was only found out in the 1960s or so. So, um, from then on, you know, astronomy grew quite quickly here, and that's why we have the Institute for Astronomy, not just uh, here in Oahu, but branches in Maui and Hilo as well. Yeah, and th there's some kind of space facility too, isn't there, in Hilo on the Hilo campus? Yeah, the, there are uh, organizations like Pisces, um, which are work on like relate things related to Mars exploration. There's the Lunar Research, the International Lunar Research Park that's being worked on. There's the Mars Habitation Program that Kim Binstead from UH uh, works on. And actually, this second crew just went in, I think, today or yesterday. So a lot of space-related research here, not just straight looking at the stars. You say it happened in the 1960s. What was the aha moment that we all of a sudden knew that we were in a great place for astronomy? Well, you know, telescopes have always historically been built in places where there's mountains, so you get above the city lights and some of the clouds, um, dark locations, and it was an idea by, uh, and I don't know the history in detail, but uh, the idea was, oh, wait, maybe Mauna Kea is a good place to do this. And actually, people didn't know until some monitoring stations were set up there, and the conditions were very quickly found to be incredible, very high image quality because you're above a lot of the atmospheric turbulence, very dry, which is very good. And so very shortly after that, the first telescopes, uh, uh, including the UH 2.2 meter, went up and really showed that, wow, this is an amazing site. Who pays for these? These, these are expensive, uh, you know, uh, equipment. Sorry, uh, Various organizations, the summit of Mauna Kea is really like a pan world or mostly a pan Pacific observatory. Um, the telescopes are all partnerships really. Uh, the Subaru telescope is Japan's national observatory here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, so that was paid for by Japan's taxpayers. The Canada France Hawaii telescope is a partnership between, you can guess, Canada France and Hawaii. So those uh, entities paid for it. NASA has its infrared telescope facility, so that's paid by, for by all of us uh, through taxpayer dollars. The Keck observatories are a partnership between the University of California system and Caltech and are paid for by them and were initially paid for by the Keck Foundation, who gave a board of $200 million to have them built. So there's many different partnerships. Gemini is a big international partnership with the U.S. as the main partner, but it has Australia and Canada and others, uh, Argentina, Brazil, Chile are all partners in that program. So it really brings a lot of international science and international funding to, uh, to Billion. Hawaii. Billions. Well, once uh, we talk about the 30 meter telescope, uh, then yes, that's a one and a half, roughly a one and a half billion dollar project. Yeah. I want to talk about that. I want to reserve the last part yeah. of our show to talk about that because I mean, I'm very interested in that. 
Um, you know, and right now you have what twelve up there? Twelve. Yeah, uh, that's right. Telescope mm -hmm. facilities and the TMT, the thirty meter telescope, be the thirteenth. That's uh, I believe correct. Yeah. 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 So um, and and the people who staff these telescopes are from the consortium organizations that built them in the first place. Yeah? Yes and no. There's a lot of effort by the observatories to hire local employees, and in fact, a lot of training, like an Akamai workforce initiative, where we try to br train people for the kind of technological jobs that are there, software, hardware, engineering, even the nighttime observing jobs don't have to be people who have PhDs in astronomy. They can be people who have bachelors um, or even uh, some, let's say, vocational kind of training in the right technical field. World-class training and experience right here. That's, that's what we're trying to do. And a 30 meter has it. We'll have a big program to do that. Yeah. And they'd really like to have a lot of employees, and especially for a place like Hawaii Island, that's very important because it's a, it's a nice uh, extra pillar of the economy. So what's the relationship between uh, IFA, Institute for Astronomy, and uh, Mauna Kea? Uh, I mean, do you supervise it? Are you the arm of the university that controls what goes on up there? No, uh, the, it's, it's quite complicated. You know, there's an Office of Mauna Kea Management that I think is uh, related to UH Hilo, um, but uh, uh, the land is leased to them from the the DLNR, I think, it's a very complicated arrangement. Um, but what happens with the Institute for Astronomy is that uh, part of the, when anyone builds a telescope there, and not just anyone can build a telescope, there's a quite complicated process, part of the time goes to the people of Hawaii. So, and that's negotiated with each telescope, but it ranges from something like seven and a half to 15% of the telescope's observing time, which is extraordinarily valuable. Um, comes to the people of Hawaii and is effectively administered through the Institute for Astronomy. And so our relationship is that we are in a way partners with the, all of the observatories because we share their time. And in the case of some of the telescopes, we're actually partners in the sense that we build instruments for those telescopes or we work with them on, I mean our scientists might work with their scientists and things like that. Wow, exciting. So uh, you mentioned that uh, you know we, we found out in the 60s that this was a good place uh, because of you know cloud weather conditions, altitude, and all that, um, but it's not the only only place, is it? I mean, I know that for example, there's there's no place in the U.S. quite as good as Mauna Kea. That's right. There are places in the mainland U.S. like uh, near Tucson, in Arizona, and in New Mexico, that are good observing sites, but they're <coughs> they're not as high, they're not as dry, and what we call the atmospheric seeing, which is the what we see as a twinkling of stars with our eyes, that looks pretty to us, but it's terrible for astronomy because it's actually the blurring, the focusing and defocusing of the starlight by the turbulence in the atmosphere. So places like Mauna Kea are very rare because it's a tall mountain in the middle of the ocean. So the air gets very smooth flowing over the flat ocean, and the upper levels of the atmosphere that pass over the top of Mauna Kea stay smooth flowing, so very little turbulence. So what we want is ocean and then a high summit. Well, that's the Chilean Andes in the Southern Hemisphere, the Canary Islands, and Mauna Kea. And of those, only Mauna Kea is in the north. So. Ch now, Chile has been a source of some discussion through the years, especially in connection with the protests against the 30-meter telescope, to say that if we can't do it here, the consortium will do it there. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, Chile, I don't know the name of the yeah. mountain, but Chile has a number of telescopes already, and they mm -hmm. are in competition with us, yeah? Uh, there's, it's not, I wouldn't take it as a competition uh, between, because uh, in order to see the whole sky, you need observatories in the northern hemisphere and observatories in the southern hemisphere. So uh, including like the Gemini Observatory on Mauna Kea has a twin in Chile. Mm. Um, and it's, that's why it's called Gemini, the twins. So, <coughs> and the U.S. National Observatories have observatory, other observatories in Chile so that it can cover the whole sky. But indeed, when the 30-meter telescope was trying to select a site, what they wanted was a site that would be best for the science. If you're going to spend $1.5 billion, you want to put your telescope where the observing conditions are the absolute best. And it did come down to the last two contenders being Mauna Kea and one of the summits in Chile. There are actually multiple summits in Chile that mm -hmm. have telescopes on mm -hmm. them. And Mauna Kea turned out to be the, the winner. From the, say. from the scientific, from the scientific point standpoint, but also... That's not just science from the atmospheric conditions, which I think are slightly better here, but they're really neck and neck, but also in terms of the other facilities that are already here and the expertise and the community that we have to leverage. You don't just want to put a telescope where there's no support. Here we have all the other existing observatories to, and scientists to support the science that will come out. So let, let's, let's shift to that. Well, actually, let's take a mm -hmm. break and shift okay. to that. What I want to talk 
about with you after we come back from the break is how you get into astronomy. What makes you do that? Uh, and what kind of a life is it, you know, intellectually uh, and acad academically? Uh, and what kind of a life is it at IFA? What do you do all day? Huh? Uh, sure. and, and, and the people, you know, you mentioned, you referred to the people on the Mauna Kea, um, a community of science. Uh, do they talk to each other? And what's the format? What's the trade-off? Okay, we're going to take a short break because that's, those are heavy questions. Okay. And we'll be right back with Roy Gall, assistant astronomer at IFA on Woodlawn Drive in Manoa. Freestanding outside the campus, which is it's kind of an important point, I think. It is, and it isn't. I mean, I feel like it would be nice if we were integrated into the campus, and actually, we can talk about a big initiative that's coming up that will integrate us more uh, into the life of the university. Okay, but you're closer to Safeway and Longs. Yes, we're right next to the Manoa Public Library. <laughs> yep. And this is uh, Think Tech Talks Community Matters because they do open open house to the heavens. We'll talk about that too. Right back, right back after this break. Aloha, I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Horry. Mahalo. Okay, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech Talks here on a given Thursday with Community Matters, because they do. Talking about open house to the heavens with Roy Gal, assistant astronomer at IFA, the Institute for Astronomy, a really wonderful school institute, if I may, yeah. <laughs> at UH Manoa. So, uh, Roy, what's, what's it like? I mean, did you have a moment, an aha moment, you were a kid? You know, everybody wanted to be a locomotive engineer, right? And they want to be an astronaut. Ooh, maybe that's part of it. Eh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, what got you into this area? Well, uh, I don't know the exact moment. I actually grew up in New York City, uh, where you can't see very many stars. So it wasn't looking up at the beautiful night sky. Um, yeah, I was always kind of scientifically inclined, actually much of my family is, so maybe there's a genetic component, I don't really know. Um, when I was, I remember being in fifth grade and our teachers asked, asked us, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And actually doctor and lawyer were the popular answers in my class. So when I said I was going to be a, I, actually I think at that time I thought I said it would be like an aerospace engineer or something like that, but something close. <laughs> and everyone looked at me like I was uh, out, of, out of this world. And uh, I don't know, I just found, find it fascinating. I think it really has really interesting questions and stuff that's hard to wrap your mind around, and yet we can wrap our minds around it. And so that, that, to me that's fascinating. Well, I see a number of interesting elements. I mean, one is the equipment itself. From the days of Galileo, we've, we've gone a long way. Um, and I mean, and that's interesting all by itself on on the, on the equipment and the I guess the physics and and uh, optical aspects oh, absolutely. of that and, and, and metal metal uh, and rather yeah. material science absolutely and yeah uh, and and look now thirty meters wide and I read that there's going to be one that's three times that ninety meters wide uh, then it's downscaled to I think forty two or thirty six now yeah, okay. but that was the original realistic. idea yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Anyway, um, you know, and so um, here we are uh, investigating the heavens, and this has to set up metaphysical issues for you. This has to make you wonder about the origin of the, of the universe and uh, man's relationship to things way beyond that we can't see or understand you. You must think about that. Don't you think about that? I think about that all the time. And as the main, as the, the sort of outreach coordinator for the Institute, I get asked those kind of questions a lot. So uh, it, and people have very many different viewpoints on that, as everyone knows. So I think uh, to me, uh, I'm very like physics reality based person. and. To me, it's interesting how complex the universe is. It's interesting questions of whether there's life out there and things like that. We can discuss later. Uh, uh, I think, to me, the you most. You think they're listening to us? Well, uh, you know, our radio signals have only been going out into space for 70 years, so <laughs> it is possible, based on the, you know, the latest results we have, actually, that include University of Hawaii astronomers, <laughs> that some life out there has uh, heard our uh, broadcasts. Um, maybe it's not intelligent life, so they don't have receivers. I don't know. But uh, the, um, I think to me the most incredible thing, and what is in a way mind blowing, is that we have these small sort of half pound brains in our head, and they have actually been capable of revealing so much about this incredibly vast and complicated universe. And uh, 
that to me that should be inspirational to everyone and to especially to the kids we talked about you know how do you become an astronomer or something like that I think that's a it's a revelation to think that just those eight ounces can do so much and we all have that capability within us with the right training and the right inspiration and the right motivation it's a lofty career for sure I, I'm, I, I'm joking. Yeah, <laughs> to some, I guess. So. <laughs> so, what kind of you know subjects did you have to study to become a real li real live astronomer? Well, astronomy is really just the physics of the universe. So, uh, you go to an undergraduate program, and most of the people do physics. Sometimes there are astronomy or astrophysics majors. Actually, UH Reno is about to introduce one next year. Um, and that it consists usually pretty much of a physics major minus some physics classes plus some astronomy classes. And then you go on, and if you're going to do research, you do a PhD in, ast in astronomy at a program like the one at the Institute for Astronomy. Um, but so it's a PhD program. A PhD uh, are program. Are you a graduate of that or some other program? No, I'm a graduate of a Caltech's PhD program. Okay. But we have about 40 graduate students uh, over five or six years, so we produce about five PhDs a year. <coughs> What, what kind of jobs do they get? Is it all academic or? No. Well, it's, it's the telescopes, I guess. Uh, oh, our PhDs, and just like PhDs uh, anywhere else in any other field, uh, spread out once they've uh, gotten their PhDs. So they have jobs uh, at teaching universities, at research labs, at, um, at more uh, academic places. So it's all over the map today what you do in uh, astronomy. There's no, there are very few places where you can be what used to be the, the armchair astronomer who sat there, did his or her research, um, and that was really the only thing that they had to do. Today you sort of have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades where you have to be able to teach well, you have to be able to speak to the public, you have to write grants, you have to use your telescopes and all kinds of things like that. Forgive me, but I'm driven by curiosity. It makes Please. me do the, all of this. What was your uh, PhD uh, dissertation? What was the subject? I studied, and I still study, um, clusters of galaxies. Um, so galaxies like the Milky Way that uh, we, the sun is part of um, are grouped together in the universe. They're not just randomly sprinkled throughout. We're part of a group of galaxies with us and Andromeda Galaxy and a bunch of smaller galaxies. But there are bigger agglomerations of galaxies called clusters that have hundreds or even thousands of galaxies that are all held together by their mutual gravity. And uh, so I was actually looking for those and trying to catalog them and look at their distribution, which actually offers us clues to the structure of the universe. And today I actually study how galaxies that live in these clusters evolve, how they change over time, and we see that they change differently than galaxies in groups like the Milky Way and then galaxies that are more isolated. And the physics is very complicated, and so that's what we're trying to do by looking back in time, sort of by doing galaxy archaeology. That's pretty interesting, and, and wow, it's physics is what it is. It is, it's, it's physics. It's not theoretical physics, it's real physics, you know? It's, it's real <laughs> physics, but it's physics that you can't touch. That's yeah. the amazing thing about astronomy is it's all remote sensing. Yeah. Um, so we can't stick our hand, thermometer in the sun, we can't go directly put a galaxy on a scale. We have to infer the properties of these objects using light, using our knowledge of physics, using math. Um, so to me, that's, it's incredible that we can actually unravel all of this with what we know today. A question I've been meaning to ask for a long time, but I'll ask mm -hmm. you, what is the difference, what is the relationship, uh, what is the exchange between the Institute for Astronomy and the Institute for Interplanetary Geophysics? Yes, yeah, so there's SOAST. Yeah? yeah, so <coughs> you're not part of SOAST. We are not part of SOAST. SOAST is its own uh, organized research unit. We are an organized research unit. SOAST is a school of ocean and earth science and technology. Yeah, they're a school, and then there's a yeah. So it's comp the university structure is complicated, but we have people who work together and who collaborate on some of the planetary stuff. There's an especially strong connection via an organization called the NASA Astrobiology Institute, um, which is a competitively funded institute at the university that brings together astronomers, geophysicists, planetary scientists, biologists, oceanographers, mm, wow. and uh, uh, it's uh, the PI is Karen Meech, who's at the Institute for Astronomy. She's done work on like comet missions and things like that. Um, but the goal of the UH NASA Astrobiology Institute is specifically to understand the origin of water on Earth. So we have to understand our water, we have to understand water in the solar system and how it gets to Earth. So that requires all of these organizations to work together. And we do have a few people at HIGP, the Institute of Geology and Planetology, yeah. that, uh, that uh, work with some of our astronomers. But they're more focused on the rocky stuff in our solar system, and we're more focused on the 
stuff looking far out. Far out. Far out. Not so oh. far. A lot. We have a lot of solar astronomers, for instance. Who this, this maybe summer. that's another title for the program, right? You know, IFA is far out. Uh, <laughs> Going far I guess, out. Yeah. Right? <laughs> anyway, I wanted to, you know, I want to touch on the fact that uh, you talked about outreach. You're the outreach yeah. person. You're also the quote assistant astronomer. <laughs> what is that? I mean, what do you do every day over at IFA? Okay, so uh, the assistant means that it's just a cl faculty <coughs> classification level, or as it's assistant associate in full. It's like junior in between and the senior. Um, so I do research, I teach, I do our media stuff like I'm doing with you, and I try to coordinate um, all of our programs that go out to the public, whether it's uh, being in schools, public star parties. Actually, we can talk, I hope, a little bit later. There's an eclipse next week, no, two weeks from now, um, that we'll have a big public event for, uh, to which everyone is invited. It's free. Um, so I, I, day in and day out, I answer a lot of emails. Um, I write research proposals. I'm in the middle of writing a proposal for Hubble Space Telescope. Um, I do appearances like this. Um, I coordinate events like the open house that's coming this Sunday. So I'm our representative to the Gemini Observatory. So it's kind of like a jack of all trades. If I was in the English department in Manoa and I thought, I, I'd really like to take an elective at IFA, could I? And if I did, would you be the teacher? Uh, I have been. The class that you would probably take is Astronomy 110, which is Survey of Astronomy. A few hundred students a year take that. Really? Um, and it is designed to be an introductory astronomy course for people who will not pursue astronomy or any science major. It fulfills the university's science requirement, and uh, that's a great class to take to get just an overview. There are a little bit higher level classes that you can also take as electives. There's an astrobiology class, very fascinating, a class on galaxies, and now that we're about to start um, <coughs> a number of astronomy majors, um, we will have a more upper level 200, 300 level classes, but probably 200 level you could uh, sit in and uh, take it as an elective. That's great. You know. Anyway, the other thing you mentioned I wanted to pursue was this whole notion of collaboration. And I guess I have, sitting at this table, I've come to know that these days, uh, you know, academia is all, in fact, all science is all about collaboration, right. global collaboration. Mm -hmm. So you must be uh, in collaboration or at least in contact with other, uh, you know, uh, astronomy communities everywhere, including Chile, but everywhere. Uh, to, to, in order to sort of pool your resources, no? That's right. I think, th I wouldn't even say that there's separate communities. There is an astronomy community. There's only maybe 10,000 astronomers in the entire world. And something like, depending on how you define the profession, 3,000, 4,000 of those are in the United States. So, and we all know each other and we've moved around a lot. I mean, for instance, I was an undergrad in New York at Columbia. I went to Caltech. Then I was at Johns Hopkins, at UC Davis, at University of Virginia, and then here. So I have pr people I work with at many of those institutions. I love that pattern. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's the typical path for an astronomer is to do a number of shorter positions before they have a long-term faculty position somewhere, mm -hmm. if they even get a long-term faculty position or go work in a national lab or something like that. And during that time, you develop lots of partnerships and lots of collaborations. And today, the projects are so complicated, the science is so complicated, that you really need people who work on different facets of it. Kind of like if you go to the hospital, you'll get referred from one specialist to the other. Well, our, our specialists work together in teams to sort of form a complete picture, just like a, you need a radiologist and an and a, uh, orthopedist and a neurologist to form a complete picture of your uh, physical health. You need that to form a complete picture of whatever objects or phenomena that you're studying. So we have people who specialize in X-ray astronomy or radio astronomy or optical astronomy or on topics like black holes or galaxies. And then you bring that together into a collaboration to understand what's happening physically in a system. Mm -hmm. Well, they say that uh, you know the, 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 the one thing that turns on a researcher or a scientist is meeting other researchers and scientists and being able to have a conversation at, at that that's, level. That's absolutely true. And uh, you know, people might see these conferences that we have all over the world and wonder why do we do that. There's nothing like that one-on-one -on -one contact uh, uh, to really energize you, but also to spark ideas. I mean, even your landscapers or your architects or whoever, it's that conversation and that discussion that goes, oh, wouldn't this be a great idea? And so we try to have those <coughs> opportunities within the Institute and then by going to conferences around the world in the United States, um, 
have that happen. In fact, the biggest astronomy conference in the world is coming to Hawaii in 2015. Whoa. So, that's next year, my God. Yep, August 2015, the International Astronomical Union meeting, which is held every three years, will be at the convention center here in town and will bring about 4,000 astronomers from around the world. Can I get in? I couldn't spot the Big Dipper myself, but could yes, I get in? Yes, uh, uh, actually I'm the chair of the local organizing committee for <laughs> that. So, talk. <laughs> um, we will have uh, lots of public outreach programs. We're just in the beginning pro stages of organizing all of the different things. Um, so there will be parts of it that are open to the public. Um, it's mostly for scientists to communicate with each other, but when you bring that many astronomers, you want to engage the community. So we, we're thinking about ways to have programs where school kids can come in, and uh, we have the whole run of the convention center, so we'll probably set up a lot of public uh, things. You're involved in the planning? Yes. Ah, fabulous. Fabulous. And he's here with us. <laughs> Ray Gal, assistant astronomer, uh, and does outreach, too, at IFA, the Institute for Astronomy. This is Think Tech Talks. Community matters because it does. And we're talking about uh, open house to the heavens. We're going to get to that yes, right so. after this break. The open house will be right back. Hi, I'm David Day. I'm the host of Think Tech Asia. What we do is produce shows that have to do with international business, foreign policy, national security, and geopolitics. We run our shows on Thursday afternoons at 4 o'clock. I'll see you there. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel of Think Tech. We have some news for you. In addition to our Think Tech TV show and our Asia in Review show on Olelo 54, as of January 1st, we're adding Community Matters to play also two hours a week. Check out thinktechhawaii.com for the specific times of each of these shows. We hope you enjoy all three. Mahalo, I'm Jay Fidel. Aloha, I'm Maria Kashem of Think Tech Hawaii, and I want to tell you about our Think Tech talk shows. If you didn't know it, Think Tech streams video and audio for all of its shows live on the internet from 2 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon. And we replay them all night long on Ustream.tv. Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links. Raise your awareness on Think Tech. I'm Maria Kashem, and I'll see so you We're there. back. We're live. We're at Think Tech Talks. We're talking about community matters because it does. We're talking about open Open House to the Heavens with Ray Gal, Assistant Astronomer at IFA. And I guess uh, I'd, like, I'd like to get to that now. You're talking about these events, Ray, and one of the big events is coming up only in a few days, the Open House. Can you tell us about that? That's right. So every year in April, the Institute for Astronomy's Manoa headquarters throws open its doors and invites the community to come find out what we do and have fun. It's super family friendly. We typically have something like 1,500 people come. Oh, um, so it's this Sunday, April 6th from 11 to 4. Our address is 2680 Woodlawn Drive. You can find out about it on our Facebook page. We're UHIFA on Facebook or on our website, ifa.hawaii.edu. And um, we have lots of, there's something like 40 activities, not just from us, but from other observatory partners and astronomy partners. So I brought some goodies to show of examples of some of the things that so we'll have there. This is a, a pre a forerunner now of what's going to be shown on, on Sunday. That's right. Okay, let's let's look at it. We're going to take a minute and look at show and tell. That's right. So, um, Marshall, can you zoom in? Okay, let's we're going to see this up close. So, I brought this in. This is a relatively small telescope, but it's a special kind of telescope. It says danger. No, it says ranger. Oh, <laughs> oh it does say danger. danger. Yes. It says so, read manual before use or yes. else. <laughs> yes. So this is a, that's because this is a telescope for observing the sun. Now, usually if you look at the sun with your eyes, you should never do that. You will go blind. You should never do it with sunglasses. But this is specially designed to isolate one color of light from the sun that's produced by hot hydrogen gas. And it allows us to look through it with our eyes and see the flares and the prominences and uh, ma coronal mass ejections in the active sun that you cannot see even if you look through a regular specially shielded telescope at the sun. So we'll have this out there and people can look through it. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing I want to say about the open house. It's not just come see what we do. It's come do what we do and have fun with us. That's great. So, Can you take that cap off so I can see what's I can. Inside? It's just a... It's just a lens. It's a lens, and in here is actually something called an etalon that allows it to isolate the wavelength of light that you're looking at. It's actually adjustable, so you can tell whether the prominence is moving towards or away from you how by... Do you do, how do you isolate the, the wavelength? It's... I don't want to get into the physics of it here now, but uh, you can get this at home. You can. You can buy this online. It's called a Coronado. There's a personal version. It's like a thousand or twelve hundred dollars, and this slightly nicer version is about two thousand dollars. 
um, which we is actually paid for by donors to the institute who uh, support our outreach programs. So if you'd like to do that, please do. Yeah. Um, but we also have a bigger telescope. This is just the special filter that goes on that telescope. Looks like a gel for studio yeah. lights. Except you can't see through it. You know, even the no. bright lighting, you can't see me through here. It looks totally reflective. What's the material? It's a special, uh, kind of like a mylar. It lets through only 0.01%, so one ten thousandth of the light. This you put on our big telescope, well, biggish telescope, and you can safely look at the sun with it and uh -huh. see the sunspots and uh -huh. details uh -huh. on the sun, and we'll have that out too. You know, it's Manoa, so it could well be cloudy, but uh, usually we've had pretty good weather. Okay. We'll have lots of activities. You can make a comet. You'll have, we'll have an infrared camera. You can, okay. You can, did you say make a comet? Well, make a comet. So comets, make a comet? Yeah, comets are, we call them dirty snowballs. <laughs> so they're ice and rock. <laughs> so using a combination of dry ice, ice, and dirt, you can make something that uh, looks and behaves like a comet, and can even you'll even be able to make little explosions that'll blow apart the comet. What's the difference between a comet and an asteroid? Increasingly murky question. Oh. So it used to be comets are these icy bodies that come from the, most of them come from the Oort cloud far out in the solar system, but there are inner solar system comets like Halley's Comet. Um, and the comets are mostly ice with some rock, and as they come in, the sun heats them up, and they outgas, and you see the beautiful tail when they're close to the sun. <coughs> and asteroids are chunks of rock left over from the formation of the planets in the solar system. A planet that blew up or something. Well, not that blew up, it just basically never coalesced probably into a planet. Okay. The gravity of that <laughs> planet didn't hold it. It it never got together, you know. Okay. But Superman uh, had nothing to do with No that, Superman, right? yeah. Okay, right. Um at least not that I can tell you. <laughs> but today we've in the last few years we've discovered asteroids that sometimes become active and sprout little tails like comets. But they're out in the asteroid belt. So what's that? Yeah. Uh that's a question that people are researching now. In the last few years, we've found a handful of these. It was just an announcement a few months ago um, by former IFA astronomer Dave Jewett of finding some more of these. So it's not clear what sparks the activity. Is there a collision between asteroids that knocks off some of the outer layer and then the heating from the sun causes some outgassing or other processes? So the distinction's you know, not that clear, but uh, comets are, do have a lot of ice, uh, ices, and so well, this brings me to a question I wanted to ask you before, namely, you know, <clears throat> uh, people tend to think wrongly um, that the study of astronomy is static. It is what it is out there. But in fact, if you go back to, say, 1960 and look at the body of scientific knowledge here on Earth, <laughs> oh. you know, it, I mean, there's been dramatic changes, right, in our understanding. I, I I mean, it could not be more wrong to think of any science as static. Otherwise, all scientists would be out of a job, and we'd just <laughs> print a textbook, and it would be the same one for the next thousand years. Just the other day, they announced new outer solar system bodies were discovered. You may remember Pluto being demoted from being a planet. That was because um, an object called Sedna was discovered, which is about Pluto-sized. Um, and suddenly it was clear that Pluto is just one, probably the biggest or one of the biggest of a whole bunch of rocks out there. Well, yesterday they announced two more of these, and like two days before that they had announced another one of those. So suddenly we're rewriting what our whole solar system looks like, that there's this entire collection of material out far in the solar system that we didn't know about, and that's our solar system. Right, um, we're still How about the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's a great topic. Uh, actually, our one of our astronomers, Andrew Howard, was one of the co-authors of the paper that uh, found that using data from the Kepler Space Telescope, that something like one out of every five sun-like stars has an Earth-ish planet in the habitable zone. Ooh, well, Earth-ish. Great suggestion here. <laughs> Earth-ish doesn't mean that it has an atmosphere or anything. It's just a mass of the Earth. Okay. So or actually I think size of the Earth was the determinant. But uh, uh, that means that there's, well, there's something like 100 billion stars in uh, the Milky Way galaxy, so, and a fraction of those are like similar-ish to the sun, so there's probably billions of planets that are similar in some ways to the Earth. They could be more like Venus or could be more like Mars, you know, that have no life or no life that we know of. Um, but there's incredible opportunities out there. This is a discovery from 2013. Before then, we, the, what astronomers thought about the fraction of stars that have Earth-like planets around them, estimates ranged from almost none to almost 100%. So we had no idea where it was. 
So we're gaining this kind of knowledge day in and day out. So your work's not done just yet. Not even close, <laughs> right? Now you want to ask, what are the, do those planets have atmospheres? Do they have life? Do they have biosignatures? You know, every every answer raises a bunch of other questions. That's absolutely right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there's a kid by the name of Christopher Lindsay who I interviewed yesterday at the science fair, mm -hmm. who actually discovered an exoplanet, and I was very impressed with that because he won. You know, he's going to go to the nationals. Um, or the internationals, yeah. as the case may be. But I, w I, I thought to myself, why, why don't I ask Roy what an exoplanet is? <laughs> okay, before I answer that question, I want to say that I drew Chris Lindsay was mentored by an IFA astronomer. Is that right? And we have a program called High Star that uh, takes kids who are interested in science, brings them to campus for like two weeks, um, and they get science mentors and they do science projects. This year, out of the 14 students who did High Star, 13 won awards at the various Hawaii district science Good fairs. Good program. So unbelievable success, and Chris is one of the real top successes of that. So unbelievable, and full credit goes to uh, the mentors, including uh, one of our former graduate students named Marco McKelly, J.D. Armstrong, who's on Maui, who he runs- mentioned J.D. Armstrong. Yeah, J.D. Uh, uh, runs our collaboration with the Las Compreas Observatory's Global Telescope Network, which is for education on uh, around the world, including sites on Haleakala. Um, so, incredible. But yeah, an exoplanet is just any planet that's not in our solar system. <laughs> Very easy. <laughs> On that note, we're going to take a short break. Yeah. Okay, that's Ray Gall, Assistant Astronomer at IFA, Institute for Astronomy. This is Community <coughs> Matters, and we're talking about uh, open house to the heavens here on Think Tech Talks. We'll be right back. Castle and Cook, Hawaii. Investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Collateral Analytics, empowering the real estate industry to make better informed property investment decisions. The Foreign Trade Zone, bringing the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone programs to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. Galen Ho, a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. Hawaiian Electric Company, and its affiliates Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island. The Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, incorporating diverse perspectives to design a flexible and forward-looking energy strategy. Hawaii Energy, the state's energy and efficiency program created to help Hawaii's residents and businesses adopt a clean energy lifestyle. Hawaii Gas, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Hawaii Pacific Health, bringing technology and teamwork together to transform healthcare in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, attached to DBED, is the state's leading technology agency. The Scheidler Family Foundation, supporting educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including ThinkTech. Okay, we're back. ThinkTech Talks, Community Matters. Uh, we're talking about, uh, how did I write my hand? Oh, open house to the heavens. Open house to the heavens. Um, we're, not, we're not quite finished with that topic. We're talk, talking with Roy Gall, assistant uh, astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy on Woodlawn Drive. And uh, we haven't quite finished our show and tell. So okay. maybe you could uh, give us some more of those things there. Absolutely. And I, I, just to talk back to the last second really quick, I want to also credit Mary Kadaoka for the High Star program. She actually runs the program. She's a former uh, high school physics teacher. And so that's why she's so great at running this kind high of High Star program is supposed to mentor kids in yes, high school? Yes, middle, like middle to high school kids, yeah. Of course, science fair kind that's of project. That's right. Yeah, you can, if they look at the IFA website and search for H-I-S-T-A-R, they'll find it. You know, is, is astronomy becoming more popular in this generation? Uh, I know, you know, science in general seems to have a real attraction these days. You know, I mean, just, I just finished walking the floor in the science fair, yeah. and I'm still high o over the way some of those kids, including, you know, 6th, 7th, 8th grade yeah. kids are so wild about science. But is it is it increasing? Is it flat? What is it like? Okay, I, this might sound a little political, but I think actually we have a divergence in society. We have the incredible progress of science and part of society that's going along with that, and ever younger and younger kids um, are getting into it, and because of technology and because of advances in how we educate and things like that, it's we can bring them in and have them do amazing things at ages where we never thought it possible before. Yeah. So I think that's, and then there's also in the US at least a strong anti-scientific sentiment among some people as well. Uh, but not among the kids, right? I don't, the kids I, are open-minded about the it. The kids are open-minded and actually, uh, you know, at the open house, one of the things we want to do is really open 
their minds to, oh, this science isn't just some boring thing you learn in class. It should be something that's active and dynamic and fun. Yeah. So as an example of that, I mean, one thing that's really popular now is Lego. So uh, it's popular when I was a kid, here. but now it's like the <laughs> second biggest toy company in, in the world. So uh, we uh, have the Hawaii Lego Users Group, HiLug. You can find them on their website at HiLug.org or on Facebook, their Hawaii Lug. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're building some aliens and some other uh, things for our uh, display. So <laughs> this is a... These are Transformers. These <laughs> are... Uh, this is... Al Oops. This alien... Uh, it's Lego. You can put it back together. This alien was a segmented caterpillar kind of thing that a, one of our 13-year-old members built. <laughs> to these are not made out of instructions or anything. Um, they're just uh, out of people's imaginations. Here's, a, I believe, a 10-year-old made this little <laughs> mech alien. And I don't know. This is a quiz for you, Jay. Do you know what has this shape? The Pentagon. Uh, it's a hexagon. Oh, it's a hexagon. Whoa. <laughs> the Keck telescope ah. is, instead of being one giant piece of glass, is made out of 36 hexagonal segments that sit together to form uh, one giant 10 meter, 33 foot diameter mirror. There's two of them on Mauna Kea. Uh -huh. Well, this is one of 36 such segments that the Lego Club has built for a scale model of the Keck telescope really? that will be about the size of this very table we're sitting at. So now the, the actual element though, if you looked up at the Keck telescope, how big would that be? These segments in real life are six feet across, 1.8 uh, meters, okay. and there's 36 of them. Okay, so this is like six inches across. Something like that, yeah. yeah so so it's about a 1 12th scale model, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, actually the 30 meter telescope will use one meter hexagonal segments, 490 92 of them. The person who designed this, Jerry Nelson, won the Presidential Medal of Science for this idea, which people thought he was insane. And he's 12. <laughs> no, that would be nice. <laughs> no, no. Well, this is uh, this is the exciting. This is the material science. It's optical yeah. science. It's a uh, it's it's a manufacturing science. It's precision well, manufacturing. Huh? Yeah, all that's incredible. And so we can talk about that a little more. I want to share one more thing from the open house. Please. So I brought this along. We'll have a scale model solar system. Okay. So. This uh, looks like a giant candy yeah. is our model of the sun, roughly the size of a tennis okay. ball. I've even put some sun spots on it. So the sun has to have a spot, yeah. I think a lot of things people don't understand is that when astronomers deal with the universe, the size scales we deal with are completely outside of anything we comprehend with our daily life. So compared to the sun at this size, about the size of a tennis ball, I've also brought the earth, and I bet no one will be able to see it. It's on the end of this golf tee. A speck. A tiny speck. It's there. You can say a tiny blue dot. I can validate that there is a tiny blue dot on the top of that. So, so it's a grain that, of sand. That's roughly a grain of sand. Actually, I found grains that small at the craft store. <laughs> so that's a size comparison of the Earth and the sun. So that's often you see pictures in textbooks that put the planets and the sun's ne sun next to each other. Well, take a guess how far apart these would be at this scale if we set up a scale model solar system. Oh, across the room? That's all exactly right. 22 feet yeah. from this speck Earth yeah. to this tennis ball sized sun. Yeah. And we're actually going to set up our whole solar system using this scale in the lawn of the Institute for Astronomy. And it will take some walking to get to Pluto. <laughs> so, but that's a really great way. We've done this with everyone from four year olds to 90 year olds. And it's a revelation of where we live in our place in the universe as this tiny pale blue dot, as Carl said. Put it all in perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Puts us into quite a so bit of perspective. So I have two more, two more questions I, I'd like to get, get to <coughs> with you before the end of our show. Yeah. Um, you know, and one of them is, uh, you talk about the sun, talk about the material science with these mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, is there, is, are we learning things from astronomy that we can use on Earth? Yes. Like, for example, solar energy, developing energy here somehow? Yeah, so... Uh, actually, right now in Haleakala, under construction is the Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope. It's a 4-meter or 12-foot diameter mirror to collect light from the sun and uh, under try to understand the sun in greater detail. Not so much for solar energy, but to understand the magnetic cycles of the sun, which when we have you know, big auroras, which we don't see here in Hawaii. Actually, in the 1930s, there were auroras that extended down to Hawaii. Things have changed. Um, well, the sun changes. It's dynamic. It goes through cycles. And we don't understand the physics of that uh, fully. But we do know that things can happen on the sun that if there's a big, for instance, what's called coronal mass ejection, ejection it can... Is that a flare? 
it's kind of like a flare, but uh, it's much bigger, and it, it actually material comes shooting out from the sun. If one of those is in our di Earth's direction and it hits us, um, it can cause blackouts. In fact, Canada had a huge blackout something like 30 years ago. It's electromagnetic. It's electromagnetic activity. It can destroy satellites. It can damage the space station and astronauts. Um, as, and as we're increasingly reliant on satellites for GPS, for cell phone communications, if we don't have advanced warning of one of these, we could really have a huge disruption that could cause, you know, global problems. So same we're trying thing with asteroids, no? Same thing with asteroids. So we're trying to understand the sun so that we can forecast, just like we try to forecast earthquakes and tsunamis and things like that, forecast solar weather. Um, asteroids is a big thing, and actually the PanStars telescope, uh, which was designed and built by the Institute for Astronomy and has the world's largest digital camera on it. Right here. Right here in Maui on yeah. Haleakala, and actually PanStars 2 is just starting operation in the fall. Um, part of its mission is to find asteroids that could hit Earth and give us warning. And there's an actual project that just started which uses smaller telescopes. It's called ATLAS, uh, developed by John Tondry, one of our Institute astronomers it is able to scan even more of the sky, but to not see as faint objects. But the idea there is to find smaller asteroids as they're getting closer to Earth. We cannot deflect them. We will not have enough time to do anything about them, except that with about three days to a week of warning, you can evacuate and save millions of people. If one of those asteroids were to hit a populated area, you would wipe out New York City, Los Angeles, and the Chelyabinsk, uh, Meteorite that, a meteor that happened uh, last year in Russia is a great example of why we should actually think about this. This is not pie-in-the-sky stuff. Those things come in the atmosphere. <coughs> more and more of the Earth is populated. The population concentrations are high. And it might be a 1 in 10,000 years event that this happens. But we if it does like happen, it. we will <laughs> not like it. And so we want to be ready. And it's not expensive to prepare for it. The Atlas project is of order $5 million. So if you think about what we spend $5 million on here in Hawaii, um, you know, the condo building costs more than that. The ball field where, yeah. the, where the bases are with the rowing elevation, yeah. for example. Yeah, I mean, the, so those kind of things are way more expensive than something that could save potentially millions of people's lives. Last question. Um, you know, there's controversy already about, well, from the beginning, about the TMT 30-meter 30, 30 telescope. and. You know, this has a negative effect on things for sure. I mean, it's hard to say exactly <coughs> how negative or in what ways it's negative, but if I were a consortium with billions of dollars to spend, as much as I would want to spend it in Hawaii, I'd, I'd think twice that people were going to oppose my telescope for reasons that are, uh, what shall I say, uh, hard, to, hard to understand. Well, and and I'd, I'd like you to tell the people what you think about that. Okay, well, I don't want to speak for, the, I can't speak for the TMT consortium, but I will say that I think it's important to respect people's beliefs and cultural uh, affinities and those things. And so uh, I think in the past sometimes we've not done a great job of listening to that and working with the communities. Today we are much better with it. We have much greater outreach. We really try to work with the communities. There are some people whose beliefs you will never change and they're entitled to those beliefs um, and they may be in opposition to building a telescope on Mauna Kea, for instance. Um, but we think that astronomy has a huge benefit to Hawaii. And even more, if you look at the history of Hawaii, King Kalakaua invited astronomers to come to Hawaii to observe the Venus transit and to do research here. He was a very pro-scientific uh, uh, king and, and ruler. And you know, Iolani Palace, as many of you know, had electricity before the White House. So I think, uh, and of course, the Polynesian navigation is incredible and has this amazing renaissance, but that is astronomy applied to a real-world problem um, that really is why we even have people in Hawaii, and the Hawaiians are here. So I think there's a great cultural and historical connection between Hawaii and astronomy. And so, you know, for some people, that's trumped by the cultural importance of Mauna Kea. But TMT in particular has been excellent at trying to give back to the community in terms of education programs and workforce development. They'll be spending a million dollars a year on some of those programs uh, as construction starts later this year. Just uh, yesterday, a judge in Hilo affirmed that the conservation district use permit granted by the DLNR to um, the TMT consortium is good. There was a challenge to that. So, um, it's but that's true everywhere. You know, there are people who have different viewpoints. And I think it's important to not be dismissive of those, but to be respectful of them. 
and see how you can, if, even if you won't agree, I mean, how you can move ahead. And some people will just always disagree with you, but, uh, you know, you don't, you should still treat them respectfully. Yeah. Know, that's what we're trying to do. Roy Gal, assistant astronomer at IFA, <clears throat> uh, an area which is one of Hawaii's greatest resources. It is one of the great resources of the university, and astronomy is one of the great resources resources of the state. This is Think Tech. We're talking community matters. We're talking about uh, uh, open house to the heavens, which is this Sunday, April sixth, and you can come down there. What time? Eleven a.m. to four p.m. on Woodlawn Drive. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Roy Gow. Absolutely. Thank great you. Great to have you here. That was a great conversation. Aloha. Thank you. The same. Aloha.